Well, good morning, good morning. How are you? It's uh, an early spring day and uh, high white cloud, not really chilly. Now, in the southeast, we haven't really had much snow this winter. It's quite rare for us to have snow. Uh, we, uh, the wind tends, the uh, weather tends to come in over Cornwall and Wales, and then, and then takes a sharp left, and then goes up to through the Midlands to uh, Scotland. So, um, anyway, why am I doing a video today? Well, uh, I went to a dental meeting last week. It was a public policy exchange meeting. It was quite significant <clears throat> as a milestone, I think, in the development of the profession um, in a number of ways. They ask you to uh, occasionally, I think I've spoken to these guys sort of two or three or four times in the last 10 years. Every time I go, I, you know, I uh, swear I'm never going to go again. And then they leave it like two or three years and ask me and my, my ego gets the better of me. And I say, yeah, of course I'll go and give you the benefit of my 37, 38 years in general practice on the subject of uh, how to organize, uh, how, you know, how to improve uh, commissioning, how to improve uh, value for money in commissioning and things like that. But it's every time I go, it's, it gets more and more depressing. You know, the audience is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And the way these things work is that um, you what they do is they they sort of organize the meeting so they come up with a, a very very wide list of everybody they think needs to go and then they come up with a very very uh, wide list of speakers in other words they invite everybody and although um, most people think if you're invited to speak at something like this it's because you you've been carefully selected and headhunted it's uh, you know, it's a fact, and it's not limited to dentistry. It's most industries. If if you volunteer, you know, if you say yes and don't ask for any expenses, then you'll generally get listed as a speaker. Um, and the, so that's the way the money works. The most they'll pay if you say, look, you know, I can't do this for nothing, and you're not doing it for nothing because they're charging people. You know, they charge, they're charging the delegates. So it's a for-profit thing. Uh, and they're charged the delegates I think about 500 pounds each I mean you may get discounted uh, admission but uh, the whole business model doesn't rely on them giving people discounted admission so basically uh, they, the, the delegates pay 500 pounds and the speakers get about 150 so um, one delegate will pay for the speakers for the entire morning more or less or two delegates certainly will so as long as they get four delegates paying full whack, then that's the speakers pay for for the whole day. And then of course they've got things like uh, uh, venue hire and lunch. They put on lunch. So the whole thing's probably going to be costing them two, three thousand pounds, four thousand pounds. By the time you add their expenses on, which are not much really, it's a few emails, and I mean they could probably do it from their front room. In the um, in the past what happened was they used to get like a parliamentary parliamentarian to chair the meeting so they would get that this is why they're held sort of they used to be held quite close to Westminster because then someone like uh, Tony Colwyn Lord Tony Colwyn or so Paul Beresford MP could just nip out and they would chair like a morning session or an afternoon session and uh, of course that gave the uh, meeting a load of kudos if someone like uh, you know if the, an MP is is sort of seen to be hosting it um, and again it's an it's a not a very well-known fact but you know even MPs and uh, Lords I mean Lords in particular are um, usually strapped for cash and very keen to make an appearance and you know some of them would uh, they, I mean they come along they do like a five-minute introduction on what the situation is from their point of view in the Lords or the Commons and then uh, just sit there and do a bit of chairing and then nip off at 12 o'clock and and they probably get I don't know pick up 500 quid or a grand for that so it's easy money for them then they nip over and get their attendance fee in the Lords in the afternoon so 
anyway, the as the importance of dentistry has gone downhill in the overall health picture, the overall health budget. Um, so these meetings have sort of deteriorated to the point where they used to have like over a hundred people come along to each one, and I think the last one was about a dozen. It was about thirteen, and uh, in fact. Uh, I counted slightly more than that. Well, that was because a lot of the speakers were sitting in the audience. So, um, and uh, they've not attracted a, an MP or anyone to host that. So, either that or to cut down expenses, they've not bothered to hire one. So, uh, a guy called Paul Bachelor was hosting it in the morning, and he's one of the speakers. Uh, Garrulous, I think, is the best way to describe him garrulous and confused but uh, very uh, very very like a dug in you know to the establishment very well um, connected when you know with the, with the sort of the um, how can I put it with the establishment that runs dentistry you know and the Department of Health etc he's one of these guys a bit like the old uh, chief dental officer Barry Cockroft who, who knew everybody you know who knows everybody by name and spends all the day gossiping about who's doing what and what he's heard about who's doing what and who's going to what meetings and how the powers uh, shifting subtly the power structures at the Department of Health etc just a sort of a hanger on now but I think he's a professor now anyway so someone's seen fit to bestow the title of professor upon him which I suppose is inevitable if you hang around in that sort of sphere for long enough or we've survived for long enough anyway but um, I heard something quite interesting the other day it was Nicholas Ta Talib who uh, is a very very good uh, economist and some somewhat of a philosopher and was written a new book called skin in the game which was uh, elaborating on a theme that he had in one of his prior books. He uh, wrote The Black Swan, which sort of points out that uh, humans are very, very poor at dealing with momentous events that occur extremely infrequently. We're far more likely to uh, plan for something that uh, happens often but doesn't really matter much than we are to then we are to make provision for something that uh, you know really would perhaps kill our half our family but uh, we don't expect at all and uh, his other theme was uh, the skin in the game which is that markets and economies and and basically running the world should be left to people who've got what he calls skin in the game which is basically that they stand to suffer from the consequences of their decisions if their decisions are bad or wrong so you know he's got no time for politicians who dodge the draft and then uh, became sort of right-wing war hawks and start sending everybody else's sons off to war to die uh, he, you know he thinks that they in general should lead from the front and take take a risk of getting killed with the rest of the troops and one thing he said in an interview which was very uh, interesting was that um, dentists have skin in the game whereas epidemiologists don't you know and he, and he literally singled that out in fact I might cut that quote in so NHS dentistry is being run by people who at the moment have no, absolutely no skin in the game you know they don't own any surgeries they don't uh, they've never provided any dentistry and uh, the days of sort of Helen Hay and Arthur Eisenstadt and, and the massive LDC conferences that were, were all about debating policy, you know, and setting policy are all gone. Staring at these 13 faces, um, which were uniquely female, and I'm not saying that to make a point about females, but just to say that, um, you know, the chances of 13 delegates all being women is uh, one in two to the power of 13 which is a pretty high number if it, if it wasn't you know I mean if it's uh, just by chance so I'm presumed that we're being run by a sort of a 
female uh, middle managed middle management now and um, they're all sitting there really not not contributing to the debate at all and in my opinion not really understanding it you know not really having a clue what we were talking about and Paul is not uh, Paul, <clears throat> Paul Paul is a guy who uh, sort of speaks convincingly and he speaks with authority but his language is very imprecise and un unuseful in that uh, having listened to him speak for 15 20 minutes I thought to myself well what have I first of all what have I understood from that which is very little not because uh, he's not he's he's difficult to understand he's very easy to understand but he's very difficult to attribute any meaning to what he's trying to say um, and 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 yet you know he's he's very good very easy at talking to audiences can make them laugh whereas I tend to stick to uh, you know my my speeches are more like Marmite you know very concentrated and uh, it, they're either exactly what you want or exactly what you know or, or you're going to complain to the organizer about the crazy guy the one crazy guy on the menu um, when I speak to an audience what, what I'm typically doing is I'm typically speaking to one person and I know it sounds uh, daft but uh, Paul Paul talks to everybody and everybody will come away saying you know that Paul Bachelet he's a nice guy he seems to know what he's talking about I, I you know I if he's in involved in the system in some way he, he probably making it a better system I will talk to a bunch of people I might talk to 200 people and get no reaction at all and um, and yet like five years later or ten years later one person will come up to me and say look you know I heard you talk at uh, Leeds Castle or something uh, in in 1987 and what you said there I just want to tell you what you said there changed my life you know I, I completely changed either how I did dentistry or my business practices or what I decided to do and uh, it was a revelation you know and that's my strike rate, about one half of one percent, which in an audience of 13 is not, not very high, is it? You know, I'm not gonna, nobody's gonna have a revelation, are they? And that, that 13 who couldn't even, who didn't even know enough about the subject to ask one simple question, you know? History, you know, they say history repeats itself and we are, as far as I'm concerned, we're right back at where we started, you know? my suggestion that they do something like a shared savings scheme with dentistry is uh, was uh, the representative from the Department of Health asked me to clarify that because they they don't have any history there you know they don't know half of them don't probably know that the health service was formed in 1948 they certainly haven't uh, they haven't studied treatment provision systems they haven't uh, you know they don't know like you know th there's this sort of there's this very simplistic view that capitation is bad and fee for item is bad with, without the nuance of the fact that fee for item can be good you know they don't know about the shan chief inquiry uh, they just don't know it ever ever happened they don't know the history of that they don't know that um, that in a sort of a target rich environment where there is there is so much decay that uh, you have nothing to fear from a fee for item because the dentists are so busy they don't have any time to do uh, work that doesn't need to be done because they're too busy doing the work that does need to be done and coupled with a strong inspectorate uh, you know to weed out the, the few dentists you know the perhaps the non-UK trained dentists let's put it that way as it was in the past who were abusing the system and then going back to their home countries um, you know fee for item does work and then they've got this idea that capitation doesn't work either and uh, you know because of under prescription so so they can't they can't choose you know they can't make up their mind whether to do fee for item which is bad or capitation which is bad and of course capitation is the system which is chosen by Demplan and Deepass and all these third-party providers because providing the dentist sets the fees um, you know and there's some uh, there's some money floating in the system to uh, sort out a problem where a dentist who is either retiring or, or shortly going to sell a surgery does under prescribe on a capitation based system then um, 
then capitation works very, very well. But of course it doesn't work very well in the public sector because the dentist is not allowed to set his own fees and therefore, uh, you, you know, you'll, you've got an absolute recipe for under prescription. Now, Paul's, uh, you know, just drops things into his speeches, such as, you know, well, <laughs> you know, Derek says that the system in the UK is not working, but, you know, you know, we could be in America. Just think of that for a minute, you know, we could be in America. Uh, you know, I mean, look at the American system. That's a basket case. That's a private system. That's what Derek's advocating, a private system like America. And, you know, and everyone sort of has a little laugh and, and says, yeah, yeah, that's it. That's blown Derek's argument out of the water. But the problem is with that is it's not really based on any uh, impartial objective analysis of the situation. The In America, uh, the socialized care that was brought in that was sort of colloquially called Obamacare was set up in a way that meant that the health insurance companies couldn't differentiate against people who had pre-existing conditions so they did not want uh, the health companies to sign up all the healthy people and and refuse to sign up all the sick ones so what they did was they um, they they told the health companies they have to sign up everybody and then they had then a situation where the healthy people, they were relying on the income from the healthy people to pay, so the swings and roundabouts, but then the healthy people weren't going to join because it was very expensive and they weren't sick. So what happened was they then brought in a fine for healthy people if they didn't join. But the problem was that the fine was, first of all, it was unconstitutional, and secondly, it, was, um, it wasn't all that much. So people still, you know, when they looked at the health premiums and the fine, they decided that they didn't mind paying the fine for a few years. And then if they got sick, then they would be able to join and they wouldn't be discriminated against. Well, the, uh, the government never, you know, what the government should have done was they should have said, look, on 31st December 2017 or whatever, if you haven't signed up by then, then we are going to say to the health companies from that point onwards, they are going to be allowed to refuse to you cover for, for pre-existing conditions. But no politician ever did that. They, they, they still have the situation where you must be allowed to apply. You know, you, you find out you've got leukemia, you can buy health insurance. You find out you've got diabetes, you can buy health insurance. So in effect, in America, what you've got is the health companies are going bust, or rather they're pulling out of the markets. It's very rare to have sort of more than one or possibly two providers in any state now because almost all of them have pulled out and the you know because they're making a loss and so you've got the situation in America which we would have in the UK if everybody who used the NHS was sick in other words the only people the only patients that paid into the National Health Service were the sick ones and all the healthy ones uh, you know were able to withhold their NHS contribution so of course the whole thing's a basket case of course it's extremely expensive they, they only deal with <laughs> the only income they've got is from people who are sick or are costing them more than they're, they're paying in in premiums and uh, even sick people are going bankrupt uh, so uh, I think it's very unfair of Paul to uh, make a sort of a cheap sort of throwaway comment like that but then that's the problem you know the problem is we've got the management now in charge of the health service I suppose in general but certainly dentistry in particular is um, a bunch of people who are not they're not deep thinkers you know they they're either shallow thinkers like Paul or uh, people like the delegates who just sit around waiting to be told what to do and the problem is that there is nobody to tell them what to do you know they're like um, they're like the ball <laughs> they don't have a the, the Borg Queen is not really very effective at the moment. So that the collective's just spinning around in their cubes, not knowing what to do. But you know, it's it's sad really because the um, dentistry, I think, as a whole, is is getting demoted. You know, it's 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 withering on the vine now. Dentistry, it's. Uh, 
position alongside medicine is being usurped. Not not because it's it's changed relative to uh, medicine, but because um, uh, because the because I think to a large extent because of our image as, as uh, you know the fact that we've got some private sector income and that we are we, we're not suffering really as a result uh, and with most you know whether you're an NHS or a private dental surgery apparently you're making along the lines of £139,000 a year profit per, per principal which is £10,000 over £10,000 a month profit per principal um, you know they just uh, We've just been cast off, you know, <laughs> and our budgets being uh, our NHS budget in particular is being appropriated. And I think, in a way, it's, you know, it's still difficult to defend that because we, you know, th there is no, we are, how can I put it? We are one one of the very few healthcare professions where NHS practitioners are paid the same market rate as private practitioners you know we are paid NHS practitioners are paid privately um, don't you know I mean without going into too much detail about how they do that uh, and there's certainly some skullduggery involved um, but um, you know we can't we still can't say that we are we're suffering too much but you know like I always do I've said this time that's it now you know I've made them I haven't told them that but I made a mental note that I don't really want to go again it's just not it's just well I mean the main thing is like I spend a day off work and I what did I do I reached 13 people you know if I make a YouTube video I can I can reach 13 people or in a day and and possibly a thousand people over a year it's a very very old-fashioned way of delivering knowledge a very expensive you know thousands of pounds uh, being, being ch changing hands and uh, with the middleman you know getting getting the bulk of it um, it might be better just to spend a couple of thousand pounds on a professionally produced video to get a message across or Google Hangout you know just have a Google Hangout and have some people uh, discussing dentistry uh, not Paul though because he's you haven't got a clue what Google is, let alone Google Hangouts. So, anyway, here I am. Home sweet home. Work sweet work. There we are. So, I hope you have a good day, and uh, it was nice to talk to you again. Sorry to be the bearer of, uh, sort of depressing news, if not bad news. I'll uh, talk to you soon. Alright, bye.